Everyone, thank you so much for coming out to the first event in our Legacies of 1619 series, sponsored by the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Boston Museum of African American History, and Roxbury Community College. My name is Kanesorn Wall Street Channel I. I am the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And if you're not familiar with us, the MHS is the oldest historical society in the nation. We hold uh, millions of manuscript pages and documents and objects, and we collect material up to the present day. We're still collecting. We have material from uh, everyday people. We like to say that we tell a global story through a Massachusetts lens. <laughs> if uh, you are interested in uh, learning more about the society I, uh, and all the programs that we're putting on, including the other events in the 1619 series, please uh, visit our website. Uh, we have exhibits, we have academic seminars, and we have public programs. And they are made possible by our wonderful members and our donors. If you're interested uh, in supporting the work, again, please visit our website uh, for more information. This series, The Legacies of 1619, it marks the 400th anniversary of the first recorded landing of uh, Africans at, a, at an English colony in North America. And we thought this would be a great opportunity also to have a retrospective look at African American history over the course of 400 years. The first program today is uh, titled Recognition and Resilience. And so all the three panelists will be speaking to that theme, some element of that theme as we get going. The program today, of course, is in the historic African Meeting House, and we are very thankful to the uh, Museum of African American History for hosting us here. I am going to introduce our speakers in the order that they will be speaking. They will speak for about 10 minutes on the theme of recognition and resilience. And then I will throw this over to, or the, the program will go over to our moderator, Professor Bellinger here who will engage the panelists in a conversation for another 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will open this up to questions from the audience. So have questions uh, ready as we get going. Our first speaker today is Professor Peter Wurzbicki. He is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University. He is, uh, his first book is titled Higher Laws, Black and White Transcendentalists and the Fight Against Slavery. He is currently a long-term fellow at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and he is there working on an intellectual history of the Reconstruction era. Our second speaker is Professor Carrie Greenwich. She is the director of the American Studies Program at Tufts University. She is also the co-director of the African American Trail Project at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. She has a book coming out in November titled Black Radical, the Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. And she will be giving a talk at the MHS uh, when that comes out. And finally, Professor David Krugler is from the University of Wisconsin at Platteville. He is the author of multiple volumes uh, of, of, histor of nonfiction as well as fiction, and uh, including 1919, The Year of Racial Violence, which came out in 2014. Your moderator today is Professor Robert Bellinger from the Department of History at Suffolk University. He is also the director of the Black Studies Program and, Clark, and the Clark Collection of African American Literature. Thank you so much for joining us. And now, Professor Wispicki. Thanks so much. Um... Thanks so much. I want to start just by thanking uh, Kid, Katie, Sarah, Gavin, the rest of the team at the Massachusetts Historical Society, as well as the Museum of African American History for hosting us. But particularly, I want to thank you, the audience, for coming out on a beautiful Saturday afternoon to spend some time talking about this really important topic. Um, I think, of, as we've seen over the last couple of years, there's no historical topic more pressing that we can reckon with as a society than American slavery and its impact on our life and culture. So today, I'm going to talk about just a very small chunk of that big story, uh, how black and white abolitionists in the era before the, before the Civil War saw Southern slavery not as some foreign, distant thing that only existed on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, 
but as an institution that lived and breathed and shaped life even here in supposedly free Massachusetts. So I want to start my talk with an observation that William Cooper Nell, here we go, William Cooper Nell, a black abolitionist and historian made. He was speaking at Faneuil Hall, not too far from here, and although he was born in Boston and spent most of his life here, still he claimed, quoting here, that he was a victim of the slaveholding South. Unlike his white neighbors, quoting here, I am prohibited from visiting near and dear relations, unless at the risk of fines and imprisonment. Later, testifying in the State House, he explained what he meant. Here, we stand equal before the law. But that's still, I stand before you today the victim of the violated rights of United States citizenship because he was unable to visit the South like other white citizens could. And his argument was simple. The Constitution supposedly guaranteed all citizens of one state that they'd be entitled to the privileges and immunities of, citizen, of citizenship. But as a free African American in the 1850s, that was manifestly not the case. Were he to visit relatives in South Carolina, he risked being enslaved. The actions, in other words, of slavers in South Carolina reduced his ability to enjoy free and equal rights in Massachusetts. Slavery, the legacy of 1619, Nell knew, <clears throat> framed Northern culture and politics well in the 19th century. It's easy to assume that there was a clear, hard line separating the North and the South, that Massachusetts was a totally free state, that after the American Revolution it was innocent of slavery. But Nell's observation confounds that assumption. <clears throat> now, it's certainly true that Northern political culture ultimately developed in ways that were much more committed to freedom than the South. It's no small thing that the northern public eventually became willing to send hundreds of thousands of its children to die to end slavery. In fact, to some degree, the fact that they were willing to do that is exactly because they were worried about the ways that southern slavery was interfering with their own life. But that doesn't mean that slavery didn't impact in very real ways the economic, political, and legal culture of states like Massachusetts. So in this short presentation, I want to suggest some of the ways that abolitionists like Nell perceive the legacies and realities of slavery as shaping actively northern life in the 19th century. As I'm sure most of you know, Massachusetts abolished slavery during the American Revolution. The state constitution, written by John Adams, and approved by voters of the Commonwealth, seemed to, but didn't explicitly outlaw the institution. Emancipation was made real, though, through a series of lawsuits, including one in 1781 by an enslaved African American named Quack Walker, who brought lawsuits before the state Supreme Court Eventually, the state Supreme Court Justice William Cushion declared that, that slavery as an institution was, in fact, against the Massachusetts state constitution. Thus, by 1790, the first federal census reported that there wasn't a single enslaved person in Massachusetts. This was, of course, part of a trend. During and soon after the American Revolution, voters and politicians in most northern states interpreted the values of the American Revolution as contrary to slavery. These were some of the first governments in modern history that could be in any way sort of called democratic, and some of their first actions were to abolish slavery. As one recent historian has argued, the American Revolution constituted, to that point, the largest emancipation in modern history, a crucial departure from which all later anti-slavery activity would follow. But by the early 19th century, of course, the invention of the cotton gin gave rise to what scholars now call second slavery. This was the expansion of slavery in the US South, the Caribbean, and Brazil, intended to feed and produce raw materials for the new industrial revolution in Europe and here in the North. This reinvigorated Southern slaveholders, leading to new and more aggressive forms of pro-slavery politics in the South. And by the 1830s, Northern abolitionists and free African Americans were becoming aware of some of the ways that this newly empowered Southern slave owners were beginning to have a hold on the social life even in the North, even generations after these states had seemed to emancipate uh, slaves. So I just want to go over a couple of these things. First, economic. As many of you do not know, in the first part of the 19th century, New England became the center of American industrialization. This was particularly the case in textiles. Towns like Waltham, Lowell, and Lawrence were built around textile factories, in which white workers spun the cotton that had been originally picked by southern slaves. Of course, this directly linked the northern economy to slavery. So consider uh, an observation made by Josiah Quincy, I'm sure most of you have seen this statue, former mayor of Boston, he said a change had come over the free states in certain localities where cotton spinning and cotton weaving began to be a source of wealth and consequently of political power. Boston became one of these localities and of course became identified with the cotton spinning and cotton weaving interests. Quincy, by the way, is a really fascinating figure. He had been this sort of traditionalist kind of conservative um, 
Uh, he's a Federalist, mayor of Boston for a while, very establishment guy, president of Harvard. And it, in his like, late 80s, he has this sort of rebirth as this kind of radical critic of what had happened to Boston because of all of a sudden these new links with Southern slavery. So he really has the sense of like my city, Boston, is, is being lost because all of a sudden there's all of this cotton wealth in the city. Um, in, in fact, Boston itself is an interesting political fact. Uh, because it was where merchants who traded in cotton lived, consistently voted against abolitionist politics well into the 1860s, while the rural parts of the state were much more likely to support anti-slavery politics. And as that fact suggests, the economic alliance between Boston merchants and Southern planters had, had important political consequences. Many Northern politicians, like the Senator Daniel Webster, began to abandon their earlier anti-slavery principles as the merchants they represented began to do so much business with Southern planters. The Boston Whig Party, the most popular party in Massachusetts, became dominated by the faction called the Cotton Whigs, who, as their name suggests, were particularly motivated by a desire to keep cotton prices low and tariffs on textile high. Henry Adams, the grandson and great-grandson of a president, observed that thanks to the rise of textile production, a wanderer through the streets of Boston by the 1820s was much less likely to overhear someone talking about the rights of man, as maybe they would have during the Revolution, and much more likely to hear them discussing the price of cotton. A consequence of this is that it began to seem like the very legal institutions and customs of slavery were coming north. As Nell had pointed out, northern blacks were unable to freely travel between the states, one of the central rights supposedly protected by the US Constitution. But that wasn't all. Northern African Americans also could not even easily travel abroad. The federal government, controlled by Southern slaveholders in the antebellum period, was in charge of issuing passports. And they refused to grant African Americans passports because doing so might acknowledge the possibility of black citizenship. So William Wells Brown, I'm gonna put him up here. The fugitive slave intellectual complained, so I'm quoting him here, after they have degraded us, sold us, mobbed us, and done everything in their power to oppress us, then, if we wish to leave the country, they refuse us passports upon the grounds that we are not citizens. The legal power that Southern slave owners seemed to have over Boston African Americans grew worse after the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, which further eroded many of the legal rights that African Americans had. After all, the cornerstone of American law is supposedly the presumption of innocence. In other words, one should have to be considered innocent of the crime of running away unless proven otherwise. But slaves in the South did not have this presumption of innocence, and the fugitive slave law brought this Southern logic north into Boston, requiring instead that a free African American prove their freedom if they were accused by any slaveholder. Black citizens in the North began carrying around proof of their emancipation, something that seemed disturbingly similar to the practice that African Americans were forced to do in the South of carrying around a pass. Fugitive slave law eliminated the right of a trial by jury for accused slaves, representing a dramatic intrusion of Southern legal mores onto Northern soil. Slave owners could deputize citizens to join a posse to recapture accused slaves, something that seemed very similar to Southern slave patrols. William Wells Brown thus concluded, we have no rights today in Massachusetts. The white abolitionist Wendell Phillips agreed, our slave system by no means exists only on Southern plantations. And the result, as the Senator Charles Sumner declared, was that slavery is everywhere. There's no time, obviously, to give a full account of the history of the anti-slavery movement, but it's worth considering the fact that for many, both Northern African Americans and many Massachusetts white citizens, the abolitionist movement was as much about self-protection as it was about ending slavery in the South. The Civil War, in many ways, was forced to free the North as well as it did the South. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hello, yes. <laughs> Call and response, yes. <clears throat> uh, first, I want to thank the uh, Mass Historical Society, the Museum of African American History, and uh, my fellow panelists. This is a, a timely and very uh, uh, needed discussion and, and lecture, and I look forward to hearing from the audience as well. On August 25th, 1902, over 200 black Bostonians met Massachusetts Governor Winthrop Murray Crane in the Gold Dome State House in Boston. The leader of the delegation was 30-year-old William Monroe Trotter, editor of the Guardian newspaper. An 1895 Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard University, Monroe Trotter used the Guardian to foment black protests on behalf of Monroe Rogers, a 20-year-old field hand from North Carolina. <clears throat> 
Fifteen months earlier, in February 1901, a white farmer denied Rogers promised payment for work that the young black man completed on his land. A few days after Rogers demanded payment, a fire destroyed the white man's barn. Accused of arson and threatened with lynching, Rogers fled Charlotte for Brockton, Massachusetts, where the rest of his family lived. Over the next year, North Carolina authorities used everything within their power to force Massachusetts authorities to extradite Rogers back to Charlotte for trial, despite the state's recent history of lynching and lack of protection for black defendants. Trotter told the crowd outside the state house as he invoked the radical abolitionist principles in which he was raised, quote, let us be like Walker, Douglas, and Garrison of old. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Republics exist only on the tenure of being constantly agitated. Over 50 years before, during the 1850s, Over 50 years before, during the 1850s, Monroe's maternal relatives in Chillicothe, Ohio, carried muskets in their wagons of wheat and other farm goods to help fugitive slaves from Virginia and Kentucky. Back then, covert black resistance to enslavement was necessarily subversive. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Law required that all Northerners assist in the policing, arrest, and re-enslavement of black people who fled from the South's, quote, peculiar institution. Trotter's mother, who you see here, Virginia Isaacs, grew up on this family farm that served as a bulwark of black armed resistance against slavery. And when Monroe was born in 1872, she made sure that his first breaths were taken in Ross County, Ohio, surrounded, as she said, by the foremothers and forefathers of abolition. Monroe's father, who's also up here, Lieutenant James Monroe Trotter, also passed the radical legacy of antebellum black abolition to his only son. Lieutenant was born enslaved in Mississippi, but he escaped to Cincinnati as a child, attended abolitionist schools, and enlisted in the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, through which he protested unequal pay and discriminatory treatment of his fellow black soldiers. And just as his wife's radical resistance in Chillicothe undermined the fugitive slave law and supported a free black community in the Ohio River Valley, Lieutenant Trotter's radicalism led to his federal appointment to the Boston Post Office, his leadership in Boston's black politics, and his position as recorder of deeds in Washington, D.C. under the Grover Cleveland administration. During the summer of 1902, William Monroe Trotter did not have to resort to the subversive techniques used by his mother's relatives in Ohio. But nor could he rely on the political promise made to Lieutenant Trotter's generation through passage of the Reconstruction Amendments and Northern white support for, quote unquote, the Southern Negro. Still, Trotter relied on the same principles of black community resistance, militant demonstration, and radical protests that fueled the abolitionist battles of his parents' generation. Much like the Massachusetts General Colored Association of the 1820s, which was organized in this very room by David Walker and John T. Hilton, Trotter mobilized members of the state's militant racial protective agency to rally black Brockton around Rogers and his family as the young man languished in that city's jail. <clears throat> Trotter publicized the protective agency's plan to send volunteers to visit Rogers in Brockton so that black citizens could bear witness to his treatment and any surreptitious moves by the local authorities. The result was a militant chain of black defense outside the jail reminiscent of the crowd that gathered outside the Boston City Courthouse during the fugitive slave rescues of the 1850s. The racial protective agency was so visible, in fact, that the Charlotte Observer reported, rather condescendingly, on the number of Negro women who visited Rogers daily with pistols in their pockets and with bread in their uh, bags. But just as sentimentality and ceremony failed to save fugitive slaves during the 1850s, Monroe Trotter understood that community displays of solidarity required political protest to launch a radical reinterpretation of the laws that threatened Rogers' extradition. After all, much like white Massachusetts authorities during the 1830s, who insisted that federal law force them to assist southern slaveholders who sought fugitive slaves in the state, in 1902, white authorities and the general public argued that Rogers had to be extradited to North Carolina for his proper quote-unquote judgment. And so Trotter used The Guardian to rally publicity for Rogers' case in black communities across the region. Throughout that summer of 1902, churches in Woburn, Cambridge, Boston, and Brockton held protest rallies that demanded Massachusetts governor and attorney general review <coughs> Rogers' case. While Rogers' black lawyers, William Henry Lewis and Clement Morgan, obtained copies of North Carolina's extradition papers, 
and plan to file a writ of habeas corpus on Roger's behalf, Trotter placed the responsibility for Roger's salvation in the hands of his readers. Most importantly, to help pay for Roger's legal fees, Trotter ran a fundraising uh, drive through The Guardian, turning the weekly's four pages into public appeals to racial fidelity as a form of political responsibility. Quote, every colored American must willingly help bear the expense, he said. After telling readers to spend money to pay for Lewis and Morgan's services, those who might be tempted to close the paper without making a donation were told in bold red letters, very expensive for the time, the fate of the Negro race depends upon the result. The Guardian makes itself responsible for this. Every week, as the case awaited appeals before the governor and attorney general, Trotter printed contributors' names, followed by the amount that they donated and a brief description of what their donation was being used for. By early September, the Guardian raised over $120 for Roger's legal team, an impressive sum given that most contributions range between five cents and a dollar. As Trotter repeatedly insisted, again invoking uh, strength and uh, values given to him by his abolitionist ancestors, justice to all is the end and aim of all government. William Monroe Trotter's use of the Guardian to rally public support for Monroe Rogers was part of the black <laughs> radical tradition that has sustained and inspired African descended people in the United States since the first Africans arrived in 1619 J Jamestown. Of course, just as William Monroe Trotter and Rogers' attorneys never mentioned black radicalism in their appeal to the governor and attorney general, black radicalism was not a term that existed in the Atlantic world in which North American slavery emerged during the 17th century. Radicalism as a political idea, taken from the Latin word radix or root, did not emerge until the rise of Enlightenment philosophy and Republican ideology in the 18th century. Specifically, Rousseau described radicalism as the antithesis to John Locke's liberalism to explain political change in a representative republic. Yet the 18th century transformation of Britain's North American colonies from a society with slaves to a slave society, to borrow Ira Berlin's term, meant that the descendants of those Africans who arrived in 1619 Jamestown became black, and their radicalism, both political and cultural, was the byproduct of constant, unrelenting, and multivalent resistance to enslavement and exploitation. If, as one scholar has suggested, quote, African America was born on the sea from Guinea, then black radicalism in its basic incarnation, the constant task of remaking at its very root the economic, political, and cultural status quo, it was present from the moment the first Africans survived the Middle Passage and landed in the Americas. Radical abolition in particular, the political movement to end Atlantic slavery that emerged before, during, and after the Republican revolutions in 18th century Saint-Domingue, France, and North America, shaped this black radicalism across the antebellum North. Here in Boston, people of African descent sued for their freedom during the 1770s and 1780s created their own organizations to educate their communities and support their most destitute, and built churches like the African Meeting House, where we sit, uh, that provided the institutional support for the Massachusetts General Colored Association, Freedom's Journal, and the black lit assault on Southern slavery and Northern racism. By the time black Bostonians led by former Kentucky slave Lewis Hayden met in this very room to mobilize the rescue of Virginia fugitive Shadrach Minkins in 1851, the legacies of 1619 were not abstract for the African descended men and women who demanded slavery's end and the revolutionary reconsecration of American egalitarianism. And yet, Conservative backlash, both in Trotter's time and during the antebellum abolitionism of his parents' generation, always seeks to undermine black radicalism's revolutionary potential. During the 19th century, this conservative backlash resulted in Southern secession, civil war, and the eventual collapse of a radical reconstruction that sought revolutionary implementation of the country's founding principles. And during Trotter's time, conservative backlash resulted in Booker T. Washington's denunciation of black Boston's radical protests and covert support for Rogers' extradition. Washington's involvement came after North Carolina's Governor Aycock wrote a letter to the Tuskegee principal asking what he should do. They were at a stalemate. Since the 1895 speech before Atlanta's Cotton States International Exposition, Booker T. Washington emerged as the most trusted liaison between white America and the millions of African Americans segregated, disfranchised, and lynched across the former Confederacy. 
Washington's correspondence with Governor Aycock represented the type of interracial cooperation championed by racial conservatives who, like future Secretary of State Elihu Root, insisted that Reconstruction was, quote, a failure and that Negro su su suffrage was the biggest failure of all, end quote. Thus, when Aycock wrote to Washington asking for his personal opinion about the Rogers case, the Tuskegeean confirmed the North Carolinians' racial and political outlook. He urged Aycock to continue pursuing extradition since Rogers' return would be, quote, best for colored people in that state. And so Aycock sent two sheriff's deputies to Brockton to kidnap Rogers from the Brockton train station as he awaited transportation to Boston for his long-awaited meeting with the Attorney General. Back in Charlotte, Rogers was charged with attempted insurrection, quote, insulting a white man, and sentenced to 15 years of solitary confinement. He died of pneumonia and sepsis poisoning in jail in 1906. The Monroe Rogers incident in 1902 established William Monroe Trotter, the Guardian, and Black Boston, and Black Boston as the ideological heirs to the radical black abolitionist legacy of the 19th century. It also launched the birth of the radical National Equal Rights League, the Niagara Movement, and the use of mass direct action to effect political and institutional change driven and directed by black communities themselves. Although Rogers was not saved, Trotter shaped the black radical tradition rooted in antebellum abolition that fought Jim Crow, lynching, convict leasing, and racial inequity at the dawn of the 20th century. As we mark the 400th anniversary of the first Africans' arrival in Jamestown in 1619 then, it is important that we recognize that black radicalism is, is as important as black resilience. And that what Robin D. G. Kelly calls the black radical tradition is as revered as, it should be, become as revered as a tradition of political liberation and increased institutional change. And that recognition of the violent, beautiful, sordid, and multi-layered history of slavery and freedom requires us to, quote, agitate, 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 as Trotter stated, in the name of the compl complicated history from which we come. As W.E.B. Du Bois stated, quote, nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this so far as the truth is ascertainable? Thank you. We did not plan to have Du Bois follow Du Bois, but <laughs> so it will be. Yes. So I'd like, I'd like to build off a lot of the themes that, that Carrie just fleshed out for us, especially the black radical tradition. I'm going to read 1619 through the lens uh, of 1919 in a few ways. And I want to do so first by telling you a little bit about something known as the New Negro Movement, which is commonly associated with the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, but has its origins in the 1890s, when the black middle class, which was only about 2% of the African American population, but very influential, decided that a new approach was needed to reverse this deterioration of opportunity and of rights in the United States. So the New Negro Movement is a great example of resilience responding to the stripping away of voting rights for black men, which had been guaranteed by the 15th Amendment. But as Kerry mentioned, you have this radical reconstruction attempted, but it's not fulfilled. And people in the 1890s are saying, well, it's African Americans' fault, like Elijah Root. Uh, it wasn't, of course. And the black middle class is saying, how can we reverse this pernicious propaganda, and how can we get some real change underway? So obtaining political rights was key to the new Negro movement. Also, ending racial violence. Between 1882 and 1919, the low number of African Americans lynched every year in this country was around 50. That's annually. The high figure was 162. This violence was constant. It was unimaginable in its horrors and its brutalities. And it was so often unpreventable, even in the case of someone who escaped to Boston and couldn't resist or prevent extradition despite having the support of the um, ra racial protective agency. In 1917, the New Negro Movement got a boost from a very unlikely source, an unwitting source, President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and I think you're probably all familiar that Woodrow Wilson's name doesn't often come up with, a, <laughs> with reference to being a friend of African Americans. But here's how he was an unwitting but very real supporter or giving a prop to the New Negro movement. 
When he appeared before Congress on April 2nd, 1917, to ask for a declaration of war, to go into the great war that had killed whole generations of Europeans already, a war the United States had stayed out of for so long, when he went before Congress to ask to go into that war, Wilson famously declared, the world must be made safe for democracy. And African Americans responded, uh-huh, yes, <laughs> starting here at home. Consider this quote from William Monroe Trotter, who ties Wilsonian idealism to resilience, to the new Negro effort to stop this ceaseless racial violence and the murder of black people. Said Trotter, quote, the new spirit among the colored Americans of resisting attacks upon their lives is something for which President Wilson is chiefly responsible. His reiteration of noble sentiments and making our boys fight under their inspiration has given birth to a new spirit of manliness." End quote. Around 370,000 African Americans served in the military and they helped achieve victory for the Allied powers, for the United States in France. And Du Bois, like Trotter, molded Wilsonian idealism to the struggle at home. In this wonderful editorial published in the May issue of the crisis in 1919, Du Bois succinctly reviews all of the indignities, the injustices, the horrors that African Americans experience. He says, even advancement, doing well, is reason to have your life taken. This is a nation that degrades us, disfranchises us, lynches us. What are we going to do about it? We return from fighting, we return fighting. We save democracy in France, and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America or know the reason why. So you have this militant group of veterans who come back and disperse across the country. They come back to Boston, they come back to Washington, D.C., they come back home to Chicago, they come back to Omaha, to Phillips County, Arkansas. But you also have hundreds of thousands of white veterans returning home, and they're determined to maintain the system of white supremacy. And this conflict brings what historians call the Red Summer, um, which can also be called the Year of Racial Violence, 1919, because the episodes of violence weren't just happening in the summer, they took place throughout the year. They're typically called race riots, but we really should understand them as episodes of anti-black collective violence, because in almost every instance, white mobs organized for very specific purposes to take away black advancement, to punish African Americans for even perceived slights against whites, or accusations of sexual assault against white women. City after city, during 1919, the year of racial violence, cascaded into this violence. And there were victims in city after city. In just Phillips County, Arkansas, where sharecroppers organized to get a fair settlement for cotton that year, 237 black men, women, and young people were massacred by mobs, posses, and even U.S. Army troops. This happened because sharecroppers were trying to break one of the legacies of 1619, slavery by another name. The sharecropping system, that's really a euphemism, it's better called debt peonage because it found landless black family after landless black family chained to the land by crooked landowners who rigged the books blatantly and told their sharecroppers year after year, you raised a good crop, but guess what? Prices were low, you borrowed a lot, you owe me $437. This was well documented. And in 1919, sharecroppers in Phillips County, Arkansas, hired a white lawyer to sue their landowners to get a fair settlement. And that brought this racial massacre. But they fought back. They were greatly outnumbered. The number of whites killed was just five, and some of them may have been killed by their own forces in crossfire. Compare that to 237 sharecroppers and their families killed, but it was still a fighting back. And it wasn't just taking place in Phillips County, Arkansas. It was happening elsewhere. Chicago experienced one of the longest episodes of anti-black collective violence uh, late in July uh, in 1919. Uh, and here we see a great example of resilience and also this recognition of 
if the United States is going to mold its foreign policy around making the world safer democracy and go to war to do that, it needs to reform at home. Chicago's right, as a lot of you probably know, began when a young black man on a raft with friends drifted into the so-called white area of Lake Michigan. But the reason this episode of mob violence lasted so long was because organized white gangs in South Side neighborhoods in Chicago wanted to oust black residents from neighborhoods they had moved into as they tried to get out of the black belt. Segregation very much in place in Chicago. The police were ineffective. Indeed, their actions enabled mob attacks. And just like the Racial Protective Agency, African Americans in Chicago did something about it. Black veterans who had served in the 370th Regiment, the 93rd Division, seeing combat in France, the only black unit with black officers, organized self-protective details to prevent the mobs from attacking African Americans. And although we don't have photographs of the veterans in uniform patrolling, we do have photographs like this, which show how Chicago's black residents uh, organized to do something about what was happening to them. But you wouldn't know this was the happening if you read Chicago's newspapers. Consider what the Chicago Daily News said about 12 of these veterans who were later lauded by the Cook County's uh, coroner's jury for the work they did for self-protection. According to Chicago's papers, quote, a group of 12 discharged Negro soldier, soldiers, all armed, terrorized small groups of whites in various parts of the South Side this afternoon. The men are believed to be former members of the 8th Regiment, end quote, which was the Illinois Guard unit nationalized as the 370th. The article went on to say that the black men had advanced in formation, blazed away at whites. According to the article, women were fainting, Whites were scurrying to their homes, and I kid you not, the newspaper reported that a bullet ricocheted off a policeman's badge as he ran to protect these innocent whites from the marauding African-American veterans. This reads like a rejected script for Birth of a Nation, or perhaps a northern <laughs> version of it. And we have another Boston connection there since uh, in 1915, Monroe Trotter led great efforts to prevent the showing of that film, recognizing how pernicious its influence would be. As one final example of recognition and resilience, uh, a quick look at returning black troops in Washington, D.C. Uh, in February of 1919. And then a look at this flyer which these veterans posted when Washington, D.C. itself was engulfed by white mob attacks on African Americans. The League for Democracy put this out, though they didn't sign it. It was an organization of black enlisted men and officers who had formed because of their growing anger at their segregation, discrimination, and their treatment in the armed forces and their determination as veterans who had served their country to do something about it afterwards. Notice how they reference the lies that are told, recognizing how the press was playing a key role in blaming African Americans for the violence inflicted on them, the violence they were resisting. One individual who was particularly upset by this poster, which appeared, as said, all over Washington with no attribution, was a young man named J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who dispatched his staff to find out who had posted this, who was responsible. Uh, and Bureau of Investigation agents fanned out all over the city trying to find out who was responsible for this propaganda. But they never did figure it out. No one would tell them. So uh, those are my remarks for tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, Kerry, and David for three very interesting presentations and you've made my work hard trying to figure out what kinds of questions <laughs> to ask you about your um, work. Um, one of the questions in line with legacies of 1619 and also the idea of recognition and resilience, um, you spoke of um, the impact of slavery on national freedom, David. Um, in what ways has slavery, that legacy, impacted mm -hmm. national freedom? 
in the time periods that you're looking at and in the work that those who you are um, writing about, um, William C. Nell, William Monroe Trotter, and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, how were they affected by that? One thing I discovered in my research, I, I offered the example of the sharecroppers who were trying to break out of a very real form of um, neo-slavery, debt peonage. But in the writings of uh, New Negro editorialists and writers like Du Bois or James Weldon Johnson, individuals who are not living under the system of sharecropping, they adopt this metaphor of enslavement to refer to the condition African Americans find themselves in. And, and use it to, as a foil to say, if we don't resist the stripping of our voting rights and the denial of equal opportunity, we are no better than slaves. So it becomes sort of this baseline for comparison uh, among the writers of the New Negro movement. Um, and it's interesting to, to look at their rhetoric in which they say, if we don't act, our ancestors, or excuse me, our, our descendants will curse our names. So they're also forward thinking. And, and, and considering how, if they don't seize this moment and undertake what is radical to others, but for them is just making America make good on its promises, uh, they will not be remembered well. Sure. Um, well, I'll just briefly mention, um, so you know, William C. Nell is, is really well known in part also because he's one of the very first really important African American historians. He writes a, a sort of groundbreaking text about the history of black participation in the American Revolution. And that sounds like a sort of, like, you know, why I care so much about that in the middle of the 1850s, but it's incredibly important historical work. And the reason is, of course, that in 1857, uh, the, Supreme, the United States Supreme Court rules in Dred Scott that African Americans are not citizens and have no rights, which white people need respect, I think, right, is, is the line. Um, and so Nell is then is gonna go back and show, actually, there are African Americans who fought you know, at Bunker Hill and all these battles during the American Revolution. And that is, a, he's really laying claim in a really clear way to uh, sort of national citizenship and try to push back against this logic that Taney and the sort of white supremacist Democratic Party at the time was trying to, to, um, to do to write African Americans out of the, the notion of citizenship. So in this way, he used, I mean, historians like this, but he used his history as this really important um, uh, tool to try to make a case for, for uh, citizenship. Uh, just building off of what um, both of you have said, one of the things that um, William Monroe Trotter um, wove through all of his activism, particularly in Boston, was the fact that the memory of slavery was not distant to his generation. So he was born in 1872. His father was born in 1842. His father was born enslaved in Mississippi, and it was something that the family didn't really talk about, even though they talked about the pride of being abolitionists. And he grew up in a house, the house, the farm that his family owned that was a stop on the Underground Railroad, still had the muskets displayed on the walls that they had used to protect themselves, so there's a lot of proud history. But the history of enslavement itself was something that hung over all of their political talk, his, definitely his father's political talk, his mother's political talk, and then just sort of the politics with which he was um, imbued as a child and as a young person. When he was at Harvard in the 1890s, um, one of the things he was um, struck by was the way that this rise in racial conservatism had allowed um, Massachusetts in particular to rest on its laurels of being um, a safe haven for fugitive slaves while claiming that you'd done everything you could for the black people, it's time for them to pick themselves up by their boat bootstraps. There's no more need for enforcement of desegregation and voting rights, and that it was really time for, as um, um, Winthrop Murray Crane said, it's time for the Negro to stand on his own feet, right? And so Trotter's growing up in this time period, and one of the arguments he would make is that, well, what about slaveholders who never had to stand on their own feet, right? Um, they basically relied on the unrequited labor of millions of people um, that sort of built their society, right? So hit, for him and his generation, it was their fam parents who were enslaved, um, who that was kind of left unsaid at that time, given the time period, but also the, uh, recognizing that the very things that African Americans were accused of in the 1880s and 1990s that were used as excuses for denying them citizenship were the very things that Southern whites um, had been able to um, 
do without any kind of um, comment on their you know, laziness or, or lack of, of work or anything of that nature. So Trotter, if you read The Guardian, it's full of all this rhetoric. And he was you know, like a satirist, so he would have these um, cartoons where he would show you know, they're claiming that uh, we don't work. Um, well, what about you know, the um, fact that Mississippi was the wealthiest state and it had a black majority of enslaved people who produced the cotton in Mississippi? And so um, just to answer your question, so the legacy of 1619 would be this very real understanding that I think is even more greater than today, which is that um, you know the country we're living in a time, Trotter would say, 1890s and forward, where um, the very same people who were slaveholders are still alive, and they're switching the argument on us as we speak. Right? Um, it's not as if they don't know that slavery produced their, this wealth; it's that they know and they deny. So definitely, that kind of colors a lot of the, the politics that he engages in. Okay. Um, and speaking about the fact that there are certain things that are denied in the understanding of this, um, in thinking about the legacies of 1619, um, as it is demonstrated through the fight for rights in the 1780s um, by the New Negro Movement and Black Radicalism, um, would you say, um, and, and those are all great examples of resilience, but where um, would recognition come in as we're talking about recognition and resilience? What was it that was in need of recognition? Uh, well, for, for Trotter, I believe the, the need for recognition was acknowledging that um, Reconstruction had collapsed. The promise of the Reconstruction Amendments had collapsed because that was the collective will of, of whites both in the North and the South. And that um, that meant that any reckoning with slavery's legacy um, had to account for the fact that there was a, um, Trotter would say, 1903, there's a conscious effort to um, erase our recent history, right? That there's, that um, the lack of recognition that Reconstruction existed, that you have the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution that um, constitutionally state the 14th Amendment that your citizenship is federally protected, um, and that um, the 15th Amendment that uh, black, uh, all men have the right uh, to vote, um, and it shouldn't be take, taken away except for um, previous conditions of servitude, right? And so Trotter's living at this time when these words are very alive, his father was there, when they're debating these things in the 1880s in the Congress, and Trotter's saying that the recognition needs to be that we are living in a time where literally they're, they're taking away those rights as exist, and that this, is, this history is happening at the very moment. Um, that we're you know, going to Harvard and becoming uh, you know, good citizens and all these type of things, it's the, all of these legal, um, efforts that are taking place in the 1880s, 1890s are taking away the rights that are actually guaranteed in the Constitution. Uh, for some New Negro writers, the recognition, and it's, this doesn't apply to all because a lot of New Negroes were socialists and they're coming at it from a totally different view, but for many, the recognition is that the U.S. government doesn't have to worry about the patriotism of African Americans who have been fighting for their country since in Boston with Crispus Attucks. And this was very much a concern as the United States drifts toward war and as it goes into and mobilizes for war, what about all these hyphenate Americans, all the Germans, uh, the Irish, all of these European immigrants? Will their loyalties oscillate back toward the old world or will they support their new country? African American writers are saying this is no concern whatsoever for the U.S. government. They don't have to worry about it because we are loyal and patriotic and always have been. And another example of recognition, I, I came across an advertisement in a, a short published weekly in Wisconsin, uh, an African American newspaper known as the Wisconsin Weekly Blade. In, in the early 20th century, Wisconsin did not have a lot of black residents, but this uh, issue in uh, the summer of 1919 held a full page ad for a celebration at the state fairgrounds in Milwaukee in August of 1919, two days to celebrate in 1919 the arrival of the first Africans to the United States in 1619. And our, our first response is, but what is there to celebrate? Because they were brought as, as slaves. But I think the purpose of the celebration was to say, look who's been here for so long. Look which Americans can trace their ancestry back to the first ships here, before the Mayflower, we might add. <laughs> <laughs>
I mentioned just a really brief, briefly, um, you know, in Boston, on the Commons, you, you probably have all passed by this monument to the, um, you know, martyrs of the uh, Boston Massacre. And that is in, in part a sort of a legacy of the activism of, of Etchinell himself, who starts this campaign in 1850, 1851, and a little bit later, to um, uh, get state funding for a monument to Crispus Atticus, who he does more than anyone to help sort of um, you know, restore this this guy who had been kind of forgotten about in a lot of the early histories of the American Revolution, and he so um, Nell and some other black abolitionists they testify at the state house and they try to get money for a monument to uh, to this this black martyr of the Boston Massacre. Complicated things go on, and they're not able to actually get or this kind of complicated historical thing where they're arguing over who actually was shot first in the Boston Massacre. That's why it ends up now, there's the, all five names are on it. But he, Nell originally wanted the name to just be, the monument to just be to, to Atticus. But um, I think it's, a, it's an, just an example of the sort of recognition that he really wanted to, to, um, to be seen for the ways in which uh, African Americans had played this important role in the creation of the American nation. Okay, one uh, question, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, one of the goals I think we have in looking at 1619 and the legacies of 1619 is to um, cause us to increase and think about that time period and the history of our collective past in a broader way. Um, so I'm going to ask you, would you say, because often the work of people like um, William C. Nell and William Monroe Trotter and W.E.B. Du Bois and others is seen as something counter to the um, American story. And I'm going to ask you if you could say something about how their work is thoroughly a part of the American story. Well, um it seems that, I mean, it's just there's so many examples that, that one can cite. And I think when we look at the, the figure of Du Bois, it offers optimism as well as um, sobering reflection, right? Because here's one of America's greatest intellectuals and born here in Massachusetts, Harvard, PhD, uh, studies in Germany, decades writing for the crisis, and working to make this country live up to its, its promises talk about re recognition and resilience, but what's often forgotten about Du Bois is that late in life he left the United States and, and moved to Ghana and became a communist. And when you think about the Du Bois of uh, the era we've been talking about and the one who spoke in Carey Slide and then mine, and then think about him late in life, that's the moment for sobering reflection, that the story of recognition and resilience has not been one of linear progress but of progress and then setbacks, and, and nothing uh, is, is permanent. And perhaps that's what really is the American story then. And no one knew that better than Du Bois, and I think a lot of African American writers and, and historical figures, through their words and through their deeds, remind us of that. Oh, no, I was just going to say that I think um, once you start to place people of African descent and Native American people in the center of the story, um, then you get a picture of um, the United States that is cause access to reckon, as Du Bois was saying, with you know the terrible history that we have, but that is the truth of the history. And once you start to include those, uh, that story as central, rather as peripheral, as you know the story that's told in history books outside of February, <laughs> um, you know, right. <laughs> um, and just, just woven into the very fabric of how you learn, then it, it, um, it requires us to um, use that history um, in a way that's, you know, going to make the, the country uh, live up to its original ideals. I'm not sure I can add much, but I'll just say that, that I think absolutely what, what you said is, is correct in that even just in sort of an abstract way, you know, the American Revolution makes these promises of freedom that are obviously sort of a blank, empty check when they're first made. And um, I think it, in a lot of ways it really is the, it's the abolitionist movement, it's, the, it's, it's black soldiers during the Civil War, it's, it's later civil rights movements that, that actually realize, make, make real in, in some ways, a lot of those abstract um, ideals of, of 
equality. I mean, we wouldn't have things like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment if it weren't for the abolitionist movement that fought for all those things. Um, so really sort of making, you know, in a concrete way realized into constitutional law some of the sort of abstract principles of the Declaration of Independence that had existed but hadn't been lived before then. Okay. Are there any audience questions? Britain, of course, ended slavery fairly uh, soon after the American Revolution, and that, that was a major impetus to the, the southern states to uh, get involved in the American Revolution. I'd like to hear the panel comment on that. Um, um, he asked, he said that he had heard that uh, Britain outlawed slavery fairly early um, in, uh, during the American Revolution. Um, and that one of the consequences of that was that the southern colonies joined um, the American Revolution. Is that correct? Well, they, yeah. That they knew that process was happening, and that was their motive. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's, that's necessarily the case. I think one of the things that historians look at is the way that the age of revolutions in the 1770s through, you know, roughly 1810 was very much an Atlantic movement. And what they, all they mean by that is that, you know, it takes place in North America, it takes place in the Caribbean, and it takes place in Europe. And those are all happening at the same time. And that um, as they're happening, they manifest themselves in different ways. So in San Domingue, it ends up be leading to the largest slave insurrection in world history and the creation of Haiti in the United States. It ends up leading to the creation of the United States of America and France. It ends up leading to the uh, French, French Revolution. Um, Britain didn't outlaw slavery in its colonies until 1833. Um, and so, um, during the radical abolition movement, say in Boston and New York, that emerges in the United States, that's in conversation with what's happening in uh, Britain at the time. So you have someone like a, um, a Frederick Douglass who goes over to Europe, Western Europe, and is talking to and corresponding with activists there. You have Frederick Douglass who goes to Ireland and talks to Daniel O'Connell who is fighting against the laws that our Britain is putting on Ireland and connecting those struggles together. So it's sort of um, in terms of did the southern colonies decide to join the, um, the revolution because of England, I haven't really heard that that's the case, although you could say that, you know, one of the things that um, becomes an, an, a point of contention as they're hashing out um, the Articles of Confederation and then the Constitution is this idea um, of the South of how you're going to count and your slaves and how you're going to protect slavery, right? Um, South Carolina in particular is adamant, you know, that um, because we have a black majority, that that black majority be counted as our population. And therefore, we should have more representatives in Congress because we have more bodies in South Carolina, even though those bodies, majority of them are black and the majority of them are not free. So that definitely shapes the, the, the argument in terms of the South and the Constitution. It's why we have, they have a federal fugitive slave law in 1793 because the Southern states want um, basically the federal government to come in and return the slaves that escaped during the revolution, um, and you know protections for the Atlanta, for the um, slave trade um, uh, up until 1807. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't paint Britain as a good guy necessarily. No, exactly. <laughs> during the era of the American Revolution, they, they do, and this is really interesting. During the war itself, it's sort of a sort of established law of war that during a war you can offer emancipation in a way that legally they sort of believed they couldn't. So you had famously Lord Dunmore's proclamation, who was yeah. a British general, and offered basically, uh, you know, if your uh, master is a, um, an American revolutionary, you know, come join us and, and you'll get freedom. So thousands of African Americans in, in Virginia and Georgia and, and South Carolina do this. They run away. It's very awkward for the patriots to, yes. <laughs> just to be we're fighting for liberty but we're really mad that the British emancipated <laughs> yeah. and, and the yeah. fact that George Washington that is yeah. one of the things that prompts him to allow um, black soldiers to actually be recognized as enlisting right is because the British actually enlist black soldiers um, and tell them that they'll get their freedom is what leads to you know blacks being sent to Nova Scotia and then to Sierra Leone. So it's sort of the, this, um, this uh, if we think of it more as kind of this Atlantic story so it's a story of all these continents connecting together you have another question here and then um, I was just curious, uh, someone had made the point about African Americans not being able to get passports at a certain time. 
Um, and yet I know Phyllis Wheatley went to London. Now that would have been in the you know earliest part of America. And somebody had just mentioned a moment ago about Frederick Douglass. Uh, so I was curious uh, when that came in. Would it have been in effect at the time that Wheatley went to London? Or was this something that reflected, you know, the changing attitudes, such as, for example, the fugitive slave law and the effort on the part of the South to try to tighten the reins? So I, I had mentioned that, and, and, and just to put on the passport issue, um, I, I would have to be more of a historian on passports. But my understanding is that it takes some time for that sort of um, – for the, the need as a formal institution to, to have this document is, is actually sort of developing as nation states are developing in the 19th century. So plenty of African Americans did travel, even though they couldn't officially have the protection of the passport. But I don't know if you want yeah. to add more about it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, uh, Phyllis Wheatley also was enslaved. So if you were a slave and your master took you, you are not considered a human being. You're considered a commodity. So if her masters are taking her from Massachusetts to England, it's like you're taking, in their mind, legally, you're taking your property from Massachusetts to, um, to uh, England. In terms of Frederick Douglass and abolitionists, they could travel, but there was no guarantee that you, know, you wouldn't be told you can't come back <laughs> or you wouldn't be told that you can leave, right? You didn't have any, there's the, the federal government had no recognition that you exist. And um, uh, uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, who is another black uh, woman abolitionist in Boston, she lived a couple of blocks from here, uh, commented that you know this was kind of she called it the double bind of being a person of color, which is that sometimes you could like make your way through and you could go overseas and you had no problems. Other times, if you're not seen as a citizen, right, it could be you're just at the whims of whatever um, whoever is checking your papers at the time decides um, to do. What happened to William Monroe Trotter is illustrative of the way administrative machinery was used to do this rather than being a, a blanket rule. So um, Trotter wanted to go to Paris to participate in a Pan-African conference, and the State Department denied him a passport. So he got himself hired as a second cook on a steamer, though he had no merchant marine experience, and made a slow, hardworking journey over there. And it made him a hero in the United States, so much so that the Military Intelligence Division, in a report entitled Negro Subversion, devoted a page to Trotter and talked about how this really gave him a lot of credibility because mm -hmm. he had done that. And then there's a more famous example later in the 20th century, Paul Robeson. Yep. And William Worthy, also a, 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 a black Bostonian who um, went over to um, China during the Cold War and is talking to uh, the rise of the Communist Revolution and he's denied his passport um, on the grounds that he is of subversive character. So this is, this is something that um, even you know, today, up until very recently, you, know, you have a passport, yes, you're considered a citizen, but what does that actually mean in the historical and political context in which you, in which you um, live? Yes, and that's happened on many occasions in the yes. 19, early 1920s a group of African Americans from Detroit were denied passports mm -hmm. because they wanted to go resettle in Brazil. Yes. <laughs> and Brazil did not want that, and so the State Department, at Brazil's bequest, denied mm -hmm. them passports. We have one more question here. Um, hi. Could you speak to the role and impact of African American women during this time? Uh, well, I would say, I mean, I, I would. Oh, she said, <laughs> she, she asked, could you speak to the role of African American women? I mean, one of the things when I was writing the book on Trotter is that, oh, Trotter's sexist, Trotter's misogynistic, and he is. Um, but one of the things that um, emerges from that is when you go through and you see who's actually doing the footwork in all of this activism, right? Who's actually printing The Guardian and making sure it goes out every Saturday? Well, that's his wife, his sisters, and the various women who volunteer, right? Who's actually um, making sure that when people donate money for these causes that they go to the right places and get to the right thing? Well, it's his wife, Geraldine Louise Bindel Trotter, who's making sure that that happens. And so, you know, one of a, a very um, famous historian named Martha Jones talks all about sort of this invisible labor that all women, but particularly black women, do during these moments. And so you have to go into looking at this history with the understanding that it's probably not the black man who's saying, I did this stuff. It's probably that there's a crew of women. I mean, and even Du Bois, you know, he had Jesse Fawcett and all of these women who were basically running The Guardian as he's, you know, being Du Bois and going places and giving his papers. You know, they're the ones who are actually, you know, setting the type, making sure that the subscriptions come in. Um, and so that's, you know, uh, an area of research that, you know, since the 1970s, uh, 
w historians of women's history have been, been able to uncover. And Trotter, um, <laughs> to just <laughs> sort of bring it home, all of the money that his father left him, the, his father very wisely left it to his daughters and his wife <laughs> because <laughs> he realized that, um, you know, I would suppose that in his will, you know, he says that his irresponsible son, uh, Monroe Trotter, you know, should not be allowed to have <laughs> access. And so throughout his life, the way he's able to run this newspaper and run all these causes is because all of that money is being put into his causes. So when he wants to go to France, what happens? The women run the newspaper and they pay for his sisters, pay for him to have the satchel that sends him over to France, right? Um, so that's the kind of invisible labor that women have done and continue to do behind these sort of great men, quote unquote. In 1919, very briefly, there were numerous instances of black women who were self-defenders against mob violence. Um, and one of them was a young woman named Carrie Johnson who with her father, trying to defend her home in Washington, D.C. against a mob gathered outside. And police came in. The motives of the police aren't clear. But uh, one of the police detectives was, was killed. And, and Carrie Johnson was put on trial for first degree murder, though there had been a mob estimated a 1,000 outside her home. And she didn't know who was coming into the bedroom. And then one of the first defendants in Chicago, and when Chicago carried out justice, it, it, it was only of black defendants until the grand jury, which was all white, went on strike and said, where are the white defendants? This was a riot. There had to be some, right? But one of the first black defendants was a, was a woman who was charged with first degree murder, again, because she had shot a member of a mob trying to break into her home. One more question. Hi, I have two comments and also a question of my own. The comment has to do with the, um, Phyllis Wheatley. She was in England in 1773. And there was uh, passed in 1772 um, a stipulation that if a slave were brought from the United States to England, that slaves had the option of freedom. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Wheatley did not take that uh, because uh, Susanna Wheatley took ill during her trip there. And so she chose to go back to uh, the United States. The second comment has to do with William Monroe Trotter and that ship that he took where he peeled potatoes going over to Paris. It was the Yarmouth. Yep. And the Yarmouth was the first ship that uh, was bought uh, by Garvey. Yep. Um, so there is that connection as well. Then my question. My question has to do, I was sitting here and I had um, kind of a laugh, a, a small laugh when someone, I forget exactly whom it was, said that um, uh, one phrasing might be before the Mayflower. And I was thinking that, yes, if we look at it from that perspective, if we look at slavery uh, starting in 1619, we're only looking from the English perspective. We're not bringing in the Spanish perspective, which goes back to the 1500s. It's actually much longer then we gen are now giving it credit. Or perhaps credit is not the right word. I mean, one of, one of the things to point out with that, and, and thank you very much, and uh, this is Barbara Lewis, who runs the Trotter Center at UMass Boston. That <laughs> was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, but, um, but um, one of the things about that is that 1619, the commemorative year, and, and, we, and it's good, you know, 1619 to have the marker of the year. But one of the things that historians point out, particularly historians of the Black Atlantic would say, is that 1619, we have to understand, well, what was the status of the Africans who were brought to Jamestown? Some of them were enslaved, but then you had also others who were indentured servants, um, a man named Antonio Johnson, who ended up living out his indenture, purchasing property, and becoming a member of the Virginia colony. And so one of the things that speaks to is the way that slavery as a system evolved over time. And because it evolved over time, it evolves whatever stage the United States or the colonies are, that's where slavery is. So slavery in Virginia in 1620 looks very different than probably some of us imagine if we're like used to gone with the wind and you know Mississippi, right? Slavery in Boston and in Massachusetts looks very different than it did in New York, right? And that that's like an it's like a process that takes place. And so if we say, well, slavery actually and enslaved people were actually here in the 1500s, that gives us this whole broad story, 500 years of people of African descent having an effect on the culture and the politics and the economics in which they're engaged, either as free people or as enslaved people. Um. That brings us to the end of our time.
But in closing, I'll say that um, as we talked about the um, struggle that was going on during the American War for Independence, we have to keep in mind that while independence was what the colonists were fighting for, those of African descent were fighting for emancipation. That was a different take on what freedom was. And those two different ideas of freedom continue to wind its way down. Um, and we heard about it um, from David when he talked about the violence that whites have. So as we think about the legacies of 1619, we have many things to think about. We should think about it as not just being about slavery, but about being um, the start of African um, um, presence in the United States. We also should think about what are the legacies of 1619, not just for those of African descent, but also for white Americans. And thus, what does it mean for us as a nation? Thank you.